Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Real Chemistry. Today we're talking about the boiling points and melting points of alkanes. Boiling points and melting points follow very similar trends for these compounds, and that's why we lump them together. We're going to talk a little bit about intermolecular forces, which help explain the boiling point and melting point of alkanes. Then we'll discuss the three factors that influence these points, and lastly, do some practice problems. So first, let's think about the intermolecular forces that are present in our alkanes. Here we have a stack of four alkanes. They're all heptane, seven carbons in that chain, and they're held together by dispersion forces. That is the weakest of our intermolecular forces. So if you have alkanes with no substituents, that is, they don't have any oxygens hanging out on them or any chlorines hanging out on them, then they're just going to have dispersion forces. And that is an attractive force between our molecules. Remember, that's what an intermolecular force is. So you can almost think of it as these molecules being covered in glue, and they're held together and glued to each other. And so what that means is it takes energy if I want to pull them apart. For example, if I boil an alkane, I have to take it from a liquid to a gas. And when I go from a liquid to a gas, in a liquid everything's really close together, and a gas it's all split apart. So to go to a gas I'm going to have to take one of these alkanes and I'm going to have to pull it away from its friends. And that's going to take energy and break those intermolecular forces. So it takes energy to boil things, and similarly it takes energy to melt things. If I want to go through a melting point, that's taking something from a solid to a liquid. And that similarly pulls these molecules apart and makes them less organized, which breaks all these intermolecular forces. So what's fundamentally driving the boiling points and melting points of alkanes are these intermolecular forces. One really important point to think about right at the beginning is that as we have larger molecules, we tend to have larger dispersion forces. So the more carbons and hydrogens you have, the more spots there are basically where they can be glued together, the stronger those dispersion forces will be. And what that means is that if we take a look at different size alkanes, we'll see there's a trend for our boiling points. Here we have methane, and methane has a boiling point of a minus 162 degrees Celsius. So room temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius. This means if you come across methane, which is natural gas, it's already boiled at room temperature, right? So it, you basically would see it in everyday life as a gas. That's true as well of ethane, which has two carbons. Notice as we go from one carbon to two carbons, we get stronger intermolecular forces and our boiling point does go up some. And it goes up even further as we go from ethane to pentane. Pentane has five carbons and now a boiling point of 36 degrees Celsius. That makes it a liquid at room temperature. At 20 degrees Celsius, it would be a liquid because it hasn't yet boiled. Take home point here though is longer chains have higher melting points and boiling points. So whether we're talking about melting points or boiling points, it follows the same trend because both of them rely on the strength of these intermolecular forces. Okay, so that's the impact of chain length. What about the impact of branching? So by branching, we mean that you can go ahead and take carbons and put them on the middle of a chain. So these two different carbon structures both have seven carbons. On the right, we have our heptane from the previous slide. And on the left, we also have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they both have seven carbons, but the one on the left has many more branches. So basically we have these methyl substituents coming off of a shorter hydrocarbon. Same total number of carbons, but we've branched that structure a lot. And that's gonna change our melting points and boiling points. How is that? Well, we need to think about how they stack relative to each other. So here's what they look like if you think about trying to stack them together. On the left, notice that our branch structure doesn't have many points of contact. So, right, they kind of connect right here and right here, and maybe a little right there and right there. And if you think about these being, again, dipped in glue and putting them up against each other, there's just very few points where they can actually be glued to each other. That contrasts pretty sharply with our stack of heptane over here, where they can be connected all along these chains, and these dispersion forces then become much more strong. So branch structures stack less tightly, and that decreases the intermolecular forces. And as a consequence, more branching leads to a lower melting point or boiling point. And that means that in this case, our really branch structure on the left is going to have a lower melting point, and it's going to have a lower boiling point because of those branches. Okay, lastly, let's talk about the structure shape in terms of being cyclic or linear. So on the left here, we have hexane, and it's linear. That just means it's out in a line, it's not in a ring. And on the right we have hexane, but it's a cyclic compound, it's cyclohexane. Notice that as we went from the linear compound, it had a boiling point of 69 degrees Celsius, to the cyclic compound, 
its boiling point goes up by about 12 degrees Celsius. It turns out that has to do with how well these stack, but the take home point is cyclic structures have higher melting points and boiling points. And that's because they stack more tightly. It turns out that cyclic structures can't change their shapes and vary their shapes as much as the linear structures. And that allows them to form these nice tight stacks that are hard to pull apart and hence hard to melt or boil. Okay, to summarize, here are the three different factors that influence the boiling point and melting point of alkanes. Long chains give you higher melting points and boiling points. More branching gives you lower melting point and boiling points. And cyclic structures lead to higher melting points and boiling points, assuming that all those other factors are the same. These are all just rules of thumb. Weird things do occasionally come up if you go out and look at real molecules, but these are helpful guidelines for us to think about the melting point and boiling point of these compounds. Let's put these to the use and practice a few problems. This one says for each set of options, choose the compound with the highest melting point. So up first, we have methane, hexane, or decane. Remember that methane has one carbon, hexane has six carbons, and decane has 10 carbons. So when we recall our first rule that longer chains have higher intermolecular forces, we're gonna say that decane has the highest melting point. So that's gonna be the one with the highest melting point. Okay, next up, we got some funky looking stuff. Let's think through this. We're comparing 2-methylbutane, pentane, and 2,2-dimethylpropane. All right, first up, let's compare the number of carbons. Let's think about methylbutane. One option here is you can just draw these and then count the carbons, but actually, if we think about butane meaning four and methane meaning one, we can see that that guy has five total carbons. Similarly, pentane, we know right off the bat, has five carbons. Lastly, we have 2,2-dimethylpropane. Propane means three carbons, and methyl means one, but because it's di, that means there's two different methyl groups, each contributing one carbon, for a total of five carbons. So that means these actually tie in terms of number of carbons. Again, if you have to draw those structures out, that's great, and you can do that and then count the carbons. But if you are familiar with the base names and the substituent names in terms of how many carbons they contribute, you can kind of just quickly add those up. Okay, so what are we to think here? Well, remember that what we've done here basically is we've branched off a five carbon containing molecule in different ways. So for example, our butane, which we'll go ahead and just draw, that's 2-methylbutane. And then we have pentane, one, two, three, four, five. And then we have 2,2-dimethylpropane. So propane is just three carbons and then it has two methyl groups on it. Which one of those is the most branched? Well, 2,2-dimethylpropane. And that means that's gonna have the lowest melting point because it has the most branches. Remember that as we increase branching, we drop melting point. So the highest melting point is gonna be the one that has the least branches, which is of course pentane. So this is gonna have the highest melting point. Okay, last up, which one has the highest melting point? Methane, pentane, or cyclopentane? Again, we'll start by thinking about the carbons. Methane has one, pentane has five, and cyclopentane also has five. So we know right away that methane's going to lose out. It has so few carbons that it's not going to keep up with pentane and cyclopentane. And here we tie at five carbons and five carbons apiece. And that's where the cyclo becomes our tiebreaker. Remember that cyclic compounds have higher melting points and boiling points. And so that means the one with the highest melting point or boiling point would be cyclopentane. That guy is going to have our highest melting point. So that's how you can think through the melting point and boiling points of alkanes based on their structures.